Welcome to the show. Thank you for jumping through the time zone hoops. We have three different time zones covered. Uh, <laughs> Babab, you're in you're in Tomorrowland. I appreciate you joining <laughs> us from. We accommodated you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, the world's so good for me. Tomorrow. That's good. That's good. And Jesse, thanks for staying up late to to do this one. Appreciate it. No problem. I'm excited because email deliverability is one of those things that I think nobody really took seriously five years ago and has become more and more, I think it was important back then, but people just didn't realize it. And it's become more and more important over the last couple of years. Um, and so today I want to start by, you know, I, one thing I hear a lot is that, oh, cold email is dead. And I'll admit there's some hypocrisy here because I want to say in Aaron's first book, Predictable Revenue, he said cold calling is dead. Long live cold email. And then that, that kind of brought the rejoinder of like, no, now cold email is dead. So I'll, I'll call that out where it is. I know I don't know if it's written down, but I know I've heard him say that a number of times. Um, I'm, I think his favorite comment though is like, anybody tells you that something is dead has a book to sell or consulting services to sell. <laughs> so I've heard people say cold email is dead. I'm curious. What do the two of you say to that? I'm going to let Jesse. Jesse can go first and I'll follow right after. Yeah, I think it's actually just really beginning. I mean, uh, if you think about it this way, right? Like the more people that stop doing it and or and or do it poorly, right? Like both sides are really interesting because they're going to just basically kind of leave it wide open for the people who know how to really do it. And, you know, I see a lot of people that talk about messaging and they talk about other things and, and that's certainly important. But the first step is always going to be do you have a healthy domain reputation? Are you able to land in the primary inbox of the companies that you can target or the people that you're targeting? And that right there is going to be it. And the better you understand the clients that they're using, whether it's mobile, whether it's desktop, or, uh, you know, hey, are they on superhuman? Is there a way the preview looks or whatever, you know, things like that. I think all of those things combined just make it a much a much more interesting game now and it's there's going to be a, a a lot fewer people competing there and it's a huge opportunity for you love it they've off um jesse sort of said it uh it's getting more and more difficult every single day for more technical reasons and i think the the bad rep that cold email got was just because of the low barrier to entry because everyone would do it um but now that um from, from jesse's own words when you know we spoke was email clients are getting more receptive to the experience they're exposing their customers to. And as a result, they're making it more difficult for people to have uh, direct access to someone else's email primary inbox. So um, that brings us a nice little challenge to play with. So cold email isn't dead. It will never be dead. Um, it's the same as saying sales is dead. Sales is never dead. It'll never die. Um, uh, it, it, it'll always exist. It's just the more difficult it gets, the more less perceptive people are to it being an actual avenue, right? It's the same as people saying Facebook ads are dead. It's just because it's more difficult. That's it. That doesn't mean it's dead. So. Mm. It's, I think it's the people that have said that they tried it. It didn't work. And they're like, well, if it didn't work, for that's me, it. Yeah. it must not work. Right. I, I want to just set the bar here because I think there's probably a lot of people listening going, oh, well, you know, you can't put your all your eggs in one basket and, you know, my email campaigns are suffering. Um, I'm curious from the two of you, and uh, so for context here, Jesse focuses specifically on email deliverability consulting. Bebob has a tool that is designed to send cold email. So some context behind the two experience bases here. I'm curious, first to Jesse, then to Bebob, uh, what does good look like from a deliverability perspective? Yeah, so what I think from good is you really can only track, and I always ask people when I see it, you'll see like, hey, try these three things to boost your open rates. And what I always wonder is, uh, and I always ask these people, I always ask the same people, like, what are you what what are you tracking when you're doing an open rate? Like, what is it that you're tracking? And then when you know when you hear the answer, it's most of the about ninety nine percent of the time it's wrong, right? They say they're tracking how many people open their email, and I think that would be incorrect, right? Like I think, and it's becoming even more incorrect by the day, right? The more privacy, the more, uh, you know, different things that are out there like ITP, which is Apple's privacy and some of these other things, right? Like I just got an email, new email. I'm using Spark app for the email and 
I just click off the box. I'm not going to let them know that I clicked on the pixel, right? So there's a lot of things happening and it's it's going the other way, right? It's it's changing in one direction or the other. Either Apple's opening all of them or uh, you're blocking all of them. Like there's just not a lot of clarity as to what that open tracker means. And really you've got to focus on the replies. Now the replies, what you have to be careful of is you have to be careful that you're not actually distracting them. You have to ask them a question. You have to ask them for something. And if you don't, you're going to risk getting that reply. And that reply is what keeps you going, right? And this is where I think a lot of people are failing is they don't push the reply. They're trying to do some link or something like, you know, some weird thing on the other side, some video on the other side that they're trying to track them there. And, and, you know, let's just be real about it. Like that's another chance that they're going to be off the, they're not going to reply. So what's really working is to use email as it was intended, right? When it was built in 19, the early 70s, uh, and, you know, became more of a uh, internet, it's an internet protocol. And if you use it that way to communicate with people, it's a really, really strong way to do it. And if you know the laws of the country, you always want to follow the laws, but there's no sort of like social media czar on it. That's kind of watching, you know, it, it's, you could send more and it can come from you, right? It's not like social media where you would have to create, you know, a bunch of fake bot accounts where you can actually send emails as you and you could send as many as you want, really. Obviously, you're going to have to keep your domain reputation up. So that's why you wouldn't want to spam people. If you are spamming people, whatever that word means is, uh, you know, you just have to be careful there. So good looks like 5% response rates, uh, replies from people. So you can understand how your offer is working. And then a certain level of that would be positive. And that's kind of the number that varies, I think, but depends what your offer is, you know? So that, I'll let it uh, turn over to the next one. Yep. Um, I think uh, Jesse sort of nailed it as well. Um, coming on a bit more of a more objective technical side, open rates to me are just a vanity metric that your board or your client asks because it's just required and it's the way, it, you know, it's the equivalent of YouTube video views. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, anyone who's actually in the game knows that it's the subscribers that actually define the net worth of an actual, um, you know, uh, account or plus with a bunch of other things as well, engagement and so on and so forth. So it's a dead metric, uh, to be honest, what are you trying to get out of it? People say, I want to see if they land in the leads inbox, but that's not true with the amount of proxies botting that exists in this day and age at the moment, especially with Apple's mail protection policy, um, that now governs almost half of all internet traffic in the world. So, you know, um, does it really hold any value anymore? Uh, so then that comes to the next part, which is what are um, active measurements I should be tracking? Uh, I don't want to give a broad brushed answer because it's so dependent on what you're trying to get. Like Jesse said, if you're trying to get a click, then you obviously don't care about the replies. If your intent is to get a reply, then there'll be more. But if we really want to look at an ideal response rate, something that anything below that should be a flag for you. Um, very similar sentimented numbers to what Jesse said about 5 to 6% um, in reply rate. And then off that 5 to 6%, uh, you're, you're, you need to try aim for at least, uh, you know, 5 to 15% in positive response rate. That means people are showing intense signals that are not, um, don't message me or I'm out of office and people are being so out of every 100 people that reply back to you um, that you manage to invoke emotion out of, at least 15 ideally should say, yep, let's, let's, I'm keen to see what you've got. Cool. I, I wish I had intro or I had like special music for this next section because I want to go on a technical tangent and I just feel like there should be like a choo 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 choo. <laughs> um, the one thing I, I remember back in the day was when you opened a, opened an email and there was a tracking pixel, you could see the user agent. And I remember Google when Google changed that, because you used to be able to see, oh, it was from this IP address. It was this location. It was this like, they were on Firefox or they were on Thunderbird, they were on Chrome or whatever it was. And when Google changed that, like they changed the behavior so that you don't get that anymore. And specifically that means that Google's, um, that Gmail itself is loading that tracking pixel. The question I'm, I haven't been able to get clarity on, and I'm curious if you have any insight here, or either of you, 
is does Google automatically load that tracking pixel? As soon as, as, soon as I send that email, does it automatically download 100% of the images? Or does it wait until Jesse goes to answer that email and then it downloads it? it oh, I could probably answer. I mean, I don't know if you want to answer. Or if no, no, just to go for it. We'll just yeah, have so, to uh, so it really depends on your browser. Uh, so like the browser that you have. Now, if you're talking about specifically about Gmail, there's a setting in there where uh, so it's going to do it usually when you view it. So that's what it'll when you when you actually open that email. Now, the information, this is where there's other things in between, right? Because you're if you have a client on your phone, you're going to open it with the it, Apple's going to open it. And there's a setting called private relay, which is people are turning this on on their phone more now if you look. And what that does is it has a proxy with one of the Apple proxies actually goes and clicks on the pixel for you, the the image, right? That, that like one by one image, which is sort of, it could also be a JavaScript or something like that, right? Like it's clicking on that and then it's running, you know, it's running that inside that app, but they're running it for you. So what happens is you don't really know what it is. Now, there are some ways to start a, uh, you basically have to, what a lot of the email marketing organizations are doing is they're taking they're taking out that traffic the problem with cold email first of all i don't think it's really worth tracking it at that level because it's a different you're trying to get something different when you're doing uh email or newsletters right you're not getting complaints on your email marketing hopefully right because that's opt-in right so this is where you have to think about it so the answer to the question is is it's it just depends on what you have connected to that email box so if it's your iPhone and some other things that are going to block, that are going to protect you, like your Apple computer obviously has a privacy setting or your whatever agent or whatever client you're using. It just depends on whatever you're, how you're, get, you're getting your emails, right? From that, from the system, from Gmail. Some plugins do it too. Like there's plugins that will automatically open it or close it or whatever, but it, it depends on how you're, all of the things that are connected to your inbox, that's the answer. So, Got it. See, I thought Google had changed it. So it was automatically downloaded by a proxy on Google's side so that it was never, there was never a direct connection to the user's inbox. No, I don't think that's the case. Uh, Google still lets the client decide that. It's Apple that renders it preemptively beforehand um, uh, because of their iOS 15 or 14 update when they did that. They effectively did that with all their proxy servers as well. And what that natively simply means is when an email is sent to a server that is um, intercepted by an Apple system, what happens underneath that in terms of any activity is not bubbled back. So clicks, opens, like anything, right? Replies, obviously, but clicks, opens, anything. It, it hits in here, and then once it goes in there, it's just disappeared like it never comes back out so you have no understanding of what actually is happening underneath obviously people are smart they're figuring out ways but um those ways are still a little flaky and it's not the 100 percent that you um you know you would you'd expect and, and the other thing that you were asking about other so there's a difference between what they call first party and third party data now what you're talking about is first party data is when you actually have access to the log files right so what, what happens is, is like on Google data, right? Like on the Google, there you can get some level of detail of what the person's doing, but you don't have access to the log file. So what people do is they include their own open pixel or whatever, right? But what you're saying is, yeah, so Google's going to give you much less information. They're starting, you know, they're taking away different information that comes through that image. And that's like where the log files are. But like, that's kind of a, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, right? I obviously run a... Um, yeah, fair, fair marketing martech company but like it's pretty deep into the weeds but i don't want to get confused the audience here cool 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 yeah because I, I remember when they started proxying it like and i think it was like 2014 right like where you stopped getting that like the so and so downloaded it from firefox and yada 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 it was like a sweeping gmail change anyway it's not super important i was just always i've always been curious um on that so let's talk about um, I want to spend a few minutes on table stakes and then I want to get into like what can kill deliverability, what's changed in the last few years. And, and then we'll get into, we'll land the episode with like the recommended email deliverability stack. So let's talk about table stakes. Um, I suspect most people are going to know about the basic DNS settings, SPF, DKIM, DMARC. If you don't just do a Google search for SPF 
and Google or Office 365. And like Google has amazing documentation. Beyond those, are there anything else that's super critical? Yeah, definitely. Uh, really what you need to think about is, and you're talking for delivery setup or whatever, like sort of settings. Yeah. Yeah. So really what you have to do is you have to have those on. The other thing is you have to have them really, they have to be aligned. There's another problem that happens where most companies have actually, um, what they've done is they've installed too many or, or so many marketing automation systems inadvertently, which, which is good, right? Like your job board tool, your like all these different tools. And what happens is sometimes there's a collision between the alignment. So like, so I've seen a lot of companies that have actually screwed this up where if you, you know, the alignment part is part of it as well. So a lot of times people go, a lot of people use MX toolbox, which is one of the ones to check, but you'll go on and you'll say, oh, wow, it's not aligned. And what that usually means is when you go back to the return path, when you go back to the return, when it checks it, it basically sees that, hey, it's not aligned because you've you've possibly overwrote or like on the other side, it's not the right. And this happens a lot with like use a marketer. You might use HubSpot and sales loft and you have a collision there, right? There's a little bit of a, like half of it won't check out. It's like, it's not going to get you always put in spam, but there's just a lot of challenges there. So that's where it really makes sense to have your IT and team involved. The other stuff you're really going to watch out for is the volume stuff, right? Sales emails are a unique type. They're the only ones that actually get like real complaints, right? And you should expect it. And that's the other thing I don't think people do, right? Because people are now more savvy to report as spam. And this is why, I mean, I know there's even tools out there that just respond for you, but that's the worst thing you could do is help people spam more. You don't want to cure spam with more spam, right? There's there's different things that like take a donation or whatever. I'm not really sure what they do, but um, but what you need to do is not respond and report it as spam if you don't want it in your inbox, right? That gives the signals back to Google and anybody else who runs mail. That way you can prevent spam, right? That's stuff's not good either. So I guess the point is, is that you need to keep that reputation and the volumes really matter. So if you're sending a thousand out of a domain at once and you're getting X percentage of those are complaints, that looks really weird because all the other emails that come out of your company aren't complaints, right? Your marketing team's not getting complaints unless they're doing something completely wrong, which is violating to their contract, their marketing automation vendor, or your HR or your corporate or whoever it says in there, no one else is getting complaints except for your sales team. So sales emails require you to be essentially on another domain name if you're going to really use them effectively, or you're going to only be able to send maybe 50 to 100 a day on that domain. Because the second that engagement gets screwed up and you hire that six SDR to start sandblasting, that's when you're in some real trouble because now your CEO is not going to be able to email investors. Your CEO is not going to be able to email all kinds of people. And that's what usually when I get the call, because they, they search the internet for anybody who knows anything about this. And nine, nine out of 10 times they're going to come across to me, <laughs> you know, so that I'm getting these like weird, like, Hey, it's the VC of, you know, whatever. And that's, by the way, that's how I can generate a lot of my leads. But, you know, in a lot of ways that uh, that's usually what happens is that is the actual problem. And and you start to tip now your whole company is in spam. You're blacklisted at every Fortune 500 account and Microsoft Office won't let a single email through from you mm. or you're sending with another provider or office to Google. So those are some of the things that really happen is right now. So you just really have to send high quality emails and you have to send a low volume of them across your, your, your infrastructure. Cool. Viva. Sounds about right. Yeah. Other table stakes. Um, so if, if the question is determinant, um, please let me know if I understood it right. Right. Is your question trying to understand, uh, beyond SPF, DKM, DMARC, is there anything else for us to be, um, focused on in terms of deliverability boosting? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, yes. So, uh, all of it will be adding on top of what Jesse has said because um, he Jesse knows a lot of um, a lot of things. Uh, so to to jump onto his premise is is just the DKMD Mark SPF as base standards are required, but the, these platforms have moved beyond that as a way to measure anything um, deliverability wise. Sending patterns matters. 
um, sending velocity and frequency matters. Um, the the patterns when I say it is um, if you're using sending platforms, you should ensure the platform that you're using is not doing 12, 1205, 1210, 1215. There needs to be some variance, just natural variance, right? Uh, which does mean um, you don't end up sending 50 emails every single day. Some days you send 48, some days you send 52, but that is just a natural path of you know delivery. The second thing is um, cloaking up your email copy to uh, have more uh, variation. And that just doesn't mean using variables such as first name, person as first son, et cetera. Um, I believe the stat that I read somewhere was uh, was from one of the Gmail guys on Twitter. Uh, and they said uh, 92% similarity in cold emails is, uh, in, in emails is considered um, uh, math mailing. So if your email, your emails need to be at least, you know, 92% different from someone else. Uh, which means the use of spin tax is going to be pretty, pretty important. Um, spin tax is just a way of coming up with variant copy that is synonymous, like hi, hello, hey there, instead of just hi. Um, what that does is it assists Google, especially since they've moved to a more semantic-based approach. So that's why you will see the classification model has become smarter. It uses keywords and phrases now to move emails left, right in promotion box, spam box, or primary inbox. So the more you variate your copy, the better it is because when one email within a certain time gap that's sent gets marked as spam, all other email that is also sent within that same time gap will also get marked as uh, spam, even if it originally landed in the primary inbox. And that's where um, this starts getting really, really murky. And not only that, but then you start looking at patterns where you combine that with your signature. So... Uh, if you have the same signature across multiple emails that are being sent out and then it associates that variant of copy with this particular signature, that permutative combination that th then ends up causing, all right, everything, because if you, Google drives some part of their deliverability engine from their SEO engine, which is a very intelligent engine. And one of their pushes in the SEO engine is that eat experience, your expertise, authority, trust, and um, experience, Right. And expertise is actually a big factor. What we've realized, so side note, but whoever cares about marketing, is if you are associated as an expert on Google on a certain topic, just saying that you are the author or you edited that particular blog automatically improves the chance of that article ranking higher. Um, this is obviously hypothesis and, and subjective, but it's just from our experience We've seen whenever we put my name or one of my other team members' name who's known in the market for B2B um, sales, just naturally, there's a higher chance of it going up versus when we just have our uh, you know, our content team uh, who also are good at what they do, just write that. So same sort of experience. So if you put signatures that are associated positively, great. If it's associated negatively, you know, um, uh, Billy Farland from Fire Festival, not going to work out too well, right? So um, just that, yeah. I love that. You kind of touched on, um, I, so I, I love the 92% similarity. Um, mm -hmm. I love the variant, the more varied, the, the better you, you touched on kind of 50 emails a day. Is that your, what's your baseline between the two of you? How many emails per inbox are you, you sending per day? So I, I'm, I'm at 50 randomized, of course. Right. But one of the things I'd say is it really depends on your, it's actually not even the number that matters. It's the number of complaints. Yeah, right. Like it's the number, it's that engagement that you get from those 50. Like, you know what I mean? So that I mean, 50, you probably aren't going to do as much damage, right? Now, where you start to scale, and this is, you know, where obviously where tools like Smartly really come into play is you start to scale when you realize, okay, well, 50 is probably my limit for this email and this offer on this domain. That's when you start to think, okay, well. Because it is, they're they're blocking you at the domain level, right? It's important to understand that. I always get a lot of people who ask, like, "Hey, you know, I want to go set up a subdomain or or something else." It's like they're still going to block you at the domain level or the IP level. Now, if you're on Google, they're not going to block you at the IP level because everybody on Google has a good reputation. Mm -hmm. So not, you go to not the, always true. <laughs> if you look, the reputation of those IP yeah. addresses. The, yeah. That's a different rabbit hole. They're, they're, yeah, they're always on some list, but the real list is owned by Google. <laughs> so, so regardless, or, or Microsoft, right? Those are the real two owners of those. 
So that's why some of those blacklists are a little bit like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Block all of Google or because they don't segment their users. They're sharing that or those IPs. So the shared IP is where people send from now. Yeah. They'll block some of them and shut them down, but that'll just, that's sort of like, you're getting caught up in something else, but the it's point is chase too, cause you're sending from a range, yeah. <laughs> right? You, it's not like your email address is sending from one single IP. It's sending from 30 different. Yeah. So when you see it, Oh, uh, my Gmail inbox yeah. is on a blacklist. You're like, don't, don't, I don't even bother chasing those anymore. Cause you're sending right. from 30 different IP addresses and they're, you know, it's the same range, but you just can't keep track of 30 different IP addresses. Yeah. And there's, there's ones that are more focused on the domain name. Those ones you actually have to be a little more concerned about, but at the end of the day, this is the funny thing is not every not everybody realizes this, but there's there's no magic button to understand if you're in spam or not. In fact, the only person who truly knows is the person on the other end, and that's their IT team and that, right? There's no way that you can physically know if you landed in the primary inbox unless that other person showed you. The only thing you could do on the other side is test it, right? You have to test, and what a lot of people do is they'll set up inboxes around different other systems that are similar. I actually set up a lot of like Gmail with high security to see how my emails are performing, right? So I want to, I test this regularly with content and with everything. And I always, when I'm building a sequence, I'm always seeding uh, some emails in there just so I know if it's getting delivered or not, right? That's something I'm doing. Don't steal the tip or anything, but you can, but still like, that's like something I do is I make sure that I'm testing because I'll forget to check, right? And if I start landing in spam, that's just a chance for me to go see, hey, did I forget something? Is there something not on, right? I'm constantly monitoring, is the domain burned or whatever? Uh, there's just, there's a lot of things that I'm doing there. I mean, I'm sure there's some other tactics that um, you can share here. So. Yeah, I like GLock apps. I've been using that where yeah. uh, you can run automated tests um, and just check it weekly just to make sure that, um, because they do basically that, but they can automate it. I built a little tool on top of it a while ago, but it's not working anymore. Um, Vibhav, I'd love your love your thoughts. Well, the first thing is, that's the first time I heard someone call it G-Lock. So I was pronouncing it Glock this whole time. So I think either... it, since it was, there was a hyphen in it. So like back in the day, uh, it was doing Dash Lock. So which hard. makes sense because you're trying to say it's Google Lock, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but everybody calls it Glock now. And I'm like, all right. No, but it, that makes so much more sense because Glock, okay. from my understanding, is 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 a gun. Yeah. But uh, but G Lock says, all right, okay, this is learning two whole new things right now. I learned how to mute a tab, and um, that I've been pronouncing something very wrong. All right, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. This is just no. You you. It it <laughs> makes more sense, right? It makes way more sense. Um, okay. So, um, your your question was around um, something like. Glock apps or Glock apps, right? Um, and in general, uh, how do you perceive? Uh, I think Jesse said the same thing. Is is basically around why are people saying no to you? Sometimes it's very important to actually understand the reason people are saying, "I'm not interested." Because um, if you're selling protein powder to a vegan, you know they're they're not going to buy it, right? Uh, you need to sell vegan protein powder. So you you might be selling to the right person in terms of your ICP, but it, mm -hmm. the persona might be right, but the intent might be wrong. So um, if you're, sometimes people just go ahead and do this whole list cleaning perception on deliverability of emails landing in that person's inbox, but then they realize that the person is just not the right offer. And then when your spam score gets high, you end up getting a debt. So you, sometimes you should listen to why someone's not interested, right? Mm -hmm. That's the best way to clean your offer than just be like, oh yeah, um, it's not working. This pers this ICP is not keen. It it's not true. It's sometimes your your offer ICP match that overlay makes a massive massive difference. If you're selling to a price sensitive community, guess what? Put aside your sales rule book and make it price sensitive. Compete on price. If you're selling to a value based a business, then sell on outcome of revenue, whatever is there. It's people just tend to go so much by the rule book sometimes. I don't realize that there's a flexibility. Second, um, I do recommend what you said as well, is using something like G Lock apps or a mail tester or something on the other side to do more realistic testing and mail placements. Um, I think it was actually through Jesse itself. Jesse's got a very mean 
um, DMOC set up where he can actually see all your spam scores. He can see um, uh, what mailbox is doing well health-wise, what's not doing health-wise. So Jesse's probably you know at par, if not higher, than the stuff that I do in terms of um, spam score checking. But uh, yeah, I think the DMOC report is a is a great weird black forest nest egg where no one knows what the hell it does but if you use the equivalent tools it actually can give you all right you sent out 100 emails 20 of them just got marked as spam fix it right like what you're doing is not right fix it so um definitely blend your ad band marketing not with open click tracking but blend it with a, de- uh, a placement testing software whatever is in the market because that gives you a more realistic outcome. Now, are G Lock apps or Mail Tester or or whatever else in the market accurate? No. This this whole place is such a weird black box, right? Um, j- just to carry on very quickly. Yeah, w- when people tell me, um, oh, where do you get this news? Uh, uh, is there a way to verify it? I I can't because no one's Google's not there releasing a blog saying this is how we're blocking you now, right? Because obviously that's an easy way. It's simply we've got 11,000 people on the platform and everyone's doing all sorts of crazy tests and then they share that information as a center also. Um, it's a changing space every day and what I tell you right now, if you're listening to this podcast, this is 31st of May. If you're listening to it six months later, it might not be valid. True. Um, tomorrow. Some rapid, uh, rapid fire questions. And tomorrow. <laughs> and, yeah, tomorrow. You know, the 30th for me still. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was 50 sending. I got a bit distracted there. 50. Um, yeah, we recommend 50 nowadays. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, DMARC, quarantine, P, non, P. What's your P? Uh, what is your P equal on your DMARC score or on your DMARC record? It doesn't matter. Yeah, so what I do is I usually start with, uh, I'll do a reject and then just sort of like, you know, work it up to like whatever, whatever the, um, it's, I'm spacing on it right now, but you know, it's not like, there's all and there's none. Yeah. 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 So I'll just put, what I do is I'll just start, uh, well, there's quarantine too, right? Oh, court. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I'll go, like, I'll go there to, cause like, remember, I'm just like set, you know, like it just, I, I want to try to be careful cause that's really on the other side that you're dealing with it. Right. So mm. It's like what a, you know. So if you actually have one off, so I I try not to put it on the maximum, but uh, I put it like in the middle somewhere. Cool. Which I think is quarantine because reject yeah. it goes. I think it's none. Yeah, P equals none. P equals quarantine. P equals reject. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We above. We we right on this. Same setting. Cool. P equals quarantine. Correct. Beautiful. Awesome. And 50. it's all about emulating it as someone who uses it internally, right? Like. And and no one wants to loosely just allow more emails to come in or uh, things to go. So you usually want to emulate a, a straight to to not just ramp on all. It's just as simple as you need to emulate a normal email sending pattern behavior, right? That's um that's when when you know me and Jesse spoke. What he said really sit with me um quite well is it's a product, treat it as a product, right? And then the second you treat it as a product, you realize okay, this is normal behavior. So I need to actually go to normal behavior stuff. And as a result, I'll get uh, normal outcomes, which is people replying to my emails. Love it. Um, That's the other thing on the timing too. Sorry, I was interrupt, but the timing is big too, where I'll see people are like, oh, it's this is the best time to send your cold emails. And I'll be like, well, wait a second. Not anymore. If you sent all your emails at that time, there's no time that's supposed to be, you're supposed to spread them out throughout the day per domain. Right. And that's kind of like where another area I see like a lot of the the quote unquote gurus on um, LinkedIn, you'll see like, hey, the best time to send is like 805. But you, how many emails can you send it? You know, hopefully you don't send more than 20 or 30 because like you're probably going to be in spam after that. You're never going to, you know, you're not going to email to anybody. So like the old advice that people are giving is I would just kind of, you know, try stuff before you trust even the stuff that I tell you, go try it and see what you think and you know you'll come back and say it worked but but yeah that's kind of like what i always say like be careful what advice you take you could put yourself in a rabbit hole pretty quickly are there um any new records any new dns things that are like um i like i know dmark quarantine 
um, a policy is now a big one. When DMARC first came out, they said, hey, just publish anything. P equals none means nothing happens. It just means, hey, I put up a DMARC record to show you that I'm watching. Now, the new thing is you need to have quarantine. DMARC, P equals quarantine. Um, if you do a, every time I do an MX toolbox test, and I'll, I'll throw a link to like the email health check uh, down below so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. There, it seems like there's new, um, there are new errors and new warnings, maybe not errors, but new warnings that pop out, pop up. Like reverse DNS does not match SMTP banner. Um, SOA refresh value outside a recommended range. SOA serial number format invalid. What are these things? Are they relevant? Should I ignore them? Is Did my marketing team cause that? Yeah, most of that stuff you can ignore um, for the for the purposes of this. The, the ones that, the big ones that are coming, like there's something called Bimmy, right? Like that's like the, the image that you have to basically certify on your local machine. And then you have to, you know, it's like if you want to go do that. A box or something. Yeah, then you can go do that. Now you don't really need to. I have we start like I haven't tested it uh, much, but so I'll be careful. I haven't tested. Somebody could say, "Well, you're an idiot." Like I haven't tested it, so it, it could help. But I also think like the if you have the same Bimmy like on all of your domains, like I don't see that working. You there'd be a, quite an effort there, and it just isn't something that I thought I could get the return out of. Otherwise, I probably would have already built an automation for it. But, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, the other ones I haven't seen, I mean, the biggest thing is like the alignment stuff is starting to become a problem. Or if you're another one that I'm noticing is like, if you're managing a lot of domains, it's easy to screw one of them up. So what I would say is rather than going into like any of this new stuff, like I would start to look at just, Hey, do I have DKIM, DMARC, SPF on? Because it's, I have, 10 or 15 domains right now, I'm actually scanning pretty much all the domains in SaaS right now, any company that's a SaaS company, and I'm, I could see every domain that has a issue right now, mm-hmm. right? It's sort of a interesting play there, but you know, it's, I'm, I'm hoping to clean up, uh, DNS records, build a sort of like a tracking and then start emailing the IT teams, just letting them know that their, their records are off just to try to help out every company, you know, as like our, you know, I won't, I, it's one of the things we're looking to do. So anyways, but that's what I would say is check all your records, right? Like that's easy and check them frequently because you could actually screw them up pretty easily if you do anything to those domains. Hey, Bob, care to weigh in? Um, to add on to Jesse's point, I wouldn't worry too much about those. So uh, DMARC, DKM, and SPF are the main ones for deliverability. SOA is actually more, um, from my understanding and remembrance, a more server configuration issue. Um, I believe it means state of start of authority. Um, I believe uh, I might be misquoted, right? Um, that might start of authority is basically defining the principle that um, the email is not originating from the right server on uh, your right DNS engine, which means you need to look into confirming your MX records have been correct. So while DMARC, DKIM, and D, uh, SPF are more deliverability and security based protocols, um, uh, the the SOA error that you said, or whether there's a bunch of you know your reverse proxy, your reverse DNS is not set up. That is actual your setup is wrong by itself fundamentally. So you need to fix that. So um, some of them you can ignore because it's just an email provider throwing a fit because it's a new system or a new host provider, um, like Jesse said. And and some of them, if your emails are actually getting delivered, right, then ignore it. If they're not getting delivered, then obviously fix whatever is to fix. But otherwise, I would just not be too fussed about. It. I, I want to add on to the previous point. Um, I think you had Eric um, from say a few weeks ago, and 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 I like what Eric says and just said. It. I was like, email can because it's it's so so much to do nowadays. It can get uh, into an analysis paraly- paralysis thing where people are. I was like. I'm waiting for the moon to be seven degrees from the sun. And then I know the temperature needs to be 42 degrees. And that's only when I'll click send. I was like, just send. Only click with right? your left hand. Yeah. And only click with my left hand and make sure I'm like balanced on my right foot. So uh, it, it just send, right? Um, none of what we're all saying, <laughs> none of all what we're saying is is actually matters if you have a completely separate audience that we've never interacted with, right? 
just send, mm -hmm. test it out. The best part of email is it's free. Unlike Facebook ads where people say test out your ads, you're actually burning money. With with this, yes, you're burning leads, but there's an infinite number of those. So just test and everything else will be fine. Love it. I've got 10 minutes until I have to run and pick my kids up. And I, so I wanted to spend 10 minutes on what is your recommended email deliverability stack? And so okay. from, and, and let's go from like setup, like uh, if we're, if we assume the baseline of 50 emails per day, how many, say you're going to, you know, power up an SDR or an AE, how many domains, how many email accounts per domain, what tools are you using? Where do you do your bounce checks? Where do you, yeah, what do you send to? Help me understand. You want to go first? Yeah. So, uh, I would say, first of all, I would say another, like, I'd say one SDR until you start getting responses, right? And you don't really need more than that. And it might, it probably isn't even the best role for them, right? It's probably more of a, I mean, this is where it gets really weird. And I know I talked to a lot of people about this, but like, it's not, it's a, it's a terrible role for a team to start sending a ton of emails because you can't really, and they're all kind of working on their own. Like it, it usually ends in domain damage. <laughs> it's usually what it ends in right now. Right. That's what we're seeing across the board anyways. And the clients we talk to, uh, so I won't go there. That's probably a little more like depends what the person's doing, but I don't know. I mean, you give people, you know, you give your, give, give a group of people, you know, fireworks, someone could blow their hand off. Right. Like it's sort of a, um, but anyways, the stack wise, uh, I, I do like smart lead. Um, you know, and this isn't actually, I've talked to like all the tool vendors and, and, and that, I mean, the one thing that really differentiates where you got to, you know, any tool can be good, good for like the process is really what I think is you have to have this inbox for rotation strategy now. And the only way you have that is number one, you really can't pay by the inbox because mm -hmm. the inboxes are not the impact. The impact now for email is sort of like the number you can send successfully. So the metric is off on most of these companies. Uh, you know, the contact number and the um, the amount of emails is more the important thing. So that's one of the things I like Smartlead has right. And then the other thing I like is the inbox rotation. And what I mean by that is you have to be able to rotate the inboxes per campaign. And there aren't many tools that actually do this. There's only a few, right? Like you've got, you know, other tools that are out there that are doing this. And what you have to be able to do is that because... And that's tricky because that means you have to have a different domain name sending each email over a period of random time during the day. And that's where you get the real force multiplier of sort of cold email is you're protected by the fact that you're on different domain names that, and then in terms of tool or like mailbox provider, I think you want to be on Microsoft and you want to be on Google. I actually don't think you want to pick one of them. Um, maybe Zoho <laughs> to some degree, <laughs> uh, maybe we've talked about this a lot, but, uh, yeah, that's, but you you want to be on public internet, like ones that have big, large groups of public users, because if you're running your own SMTP, you're going to run into a lot of problems. So that's what I would say. And you don't want to be on the ESPs either. I see companies trying to do this too. They try to take their marketing automation tool and use that. That is a bad idea. SendGrid and Mailgun, they do not do well with that. And they know right away when you do that. So don't do that either. Uh, you will have to go through the painful process of setting up multiple inboxes, multiple domain names, and that if you do want to get high deliverability. Uh, contact records, I'd pull an API. I wouldn't even bother buying one of the big SaaS data providers, I don't think. I don't think they should be charging you based on a um, annual contract. I think they should charge oh, you by fusion. Yeah, the platform fee is dead, really. And I, I know we talked about that earlier. If somebody says something dead, but like still, it's like I don't know why anybody would want to spend like buy it by the API, buy credits, whatever, so you know you're using them, so it holds you accountable. You can cancel any time. Don't because the quality changes on these data providers, and you just got to be careful. You get locked in. Sometimes they even own the data in your own environments like you got to be very careful with that yeah so that would be my my stack and then i monitor with mx toolbox usually but you can't monitor cold emails with it it's too expensive so like i'd say g lock apps <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other one but for my main domain i use mx toolbox but for like cold email i use g lock apps or something like that 
And then I use a lot of Airtable just to monitor all the domains and, and all that. That'd be the other tool that I use. Awesome. Maybe cool. um, I, I'll, I'll jump in uh, sort of really over what Jesse said. If we start from the origination, um, on a domain patches perspective, uh, I would stick to the big players. Google is obviously the more reputed one, so get Google domains. doesn't mean you get to you need to buy Google mailboxes, but Google domains tentatively, again, this is 31st of May. Tomorrow might be a different story. Um, tentatively, Google's IPs, um, when they host your um, domain, because your domains are hosted on a name server, and that name server is attached to your DNS, and that DNS is your MX records, if that IP is blacklisted in these blacklisting tools, it's in a bad spot. So you don't want to go ahead and do that. And I've seen, unfortunately, other DNS providers putting you in, in you know, other blacklisted IPs and then that just burns your domain altogether, right? So um, I would start off with that. I would get Google or Outlook. Uh, very similar sentiment to Jesse. There's other players out there. You, you've got private email by name cheap. You've got Ionos by itself. Um, while these are DNS provided email service, pro like email engines, um, they're not exactly the most reputed, but there'll be another person listening to this saying, no, it's the best thing ever. So there's minorities in everything. So if we're looking broad patterns, Outlook and Gmail, Zoho was the darling, uh, but unfortunately, you know, um, if it's too good to be true, um, it probably is. Um, I know a lot of people who had old accounts survived, but now also there are, I think there's reports of them getting picked up by, by Zoho right now, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, for those who are not aware, very quickly, Zoho is having this mass exodus right now where they're disconnecting um, anyone doing outbound simply because they've been called out by some big players um, in the blacklist space. Next thing is uh, for uh, warm-ups, uh, you can use something like Smart Lead or there's a bunch of other tools in the market. It's it's just literally type an email warm-up and you'll see you know a bunch of people mention that. So you can go with the reviews. Um, with sending, like Jesse said, um, I think ping per mailbox is sort of a dead model anymore. You need to look for softwares that have uh, inbox rotation approach uh, that will help spread that traffic horizontally. That's just how you need to go. Um, and uh, obviously, I'll promote my own products so smart leads there, but there's tons of others um, that are coming into the space. So check them out, see the reviews, see what works best for you, and then go with those. Um, and then for reporting, uh, GLock app for mail tester is what I, I, I'm, I'm tending to use mail tester more simply because I'm trying to tending to find GLock a little iffy at times. Um, but mail tester seems to be, yes, mail tester seems to be my right now preference, but that might change. Um, uh, data providers, there's like you guessed it, there's all of them out there. There's, there's Apollo, there's, there's ocean, there's zoom in, there's, there's a million, right? Um, clay. I, I like clay because yeah. you could just get clay. It. I was going to say my actual preference nowadays is clay. Um, just cause you just get access to niche pockets that you don't, um, with these data providers otherwise. So yeah, we've got left, right. <laughs> um, that's kind of what I do. And then for mailbox management, you can either use a centralized master inbox platform, again, um, platform like ours, uh, smart Team, or you can use front. Um, it just gets a little expensive, but front can also offer you the same experience as well. So, uh, Totally. Um, I was going to shout out Smartly. The one thing that, I, that we had another provider um, that was doing a good job and we liked it. Mm -hmm. The thing, the reason we moved all of our warming and it's <laughs> a smart lead was that it um, it was just one platform fee. It wasn't a per inbox fee. And we, yeah. had, we were spending a couple grand a month on email warming with another mm -hmm. provider. And uh, I shouldn't say this in front of Abov, but it did save us up. <laughs> we saved a little cash. Yeah. yeah. Really appreciate it. The other thing that made me fall in love with Vebov was when we were talking about email deliverability and we got into the fact that this sending IP address of the, not, not just of the, not of the Gmail inbox, but of the, of the IP address okay. of smart lead, right? Of the campaign. And what you do is spin up an individual IP address for the smart lead server to connect into Gmail or Office 365. This is the thing that nobody else does that got woodpecker nuked back in the day if anybody remembers using woodpecker it used to be a great email cannon and then there was a day when it suddenly didn't work as well anymore yep mm. yeah i don't know what, what they're where they're at now but uh, i do recall there was a big exodus exodus out of them uh, mm. a while back because of this um and i do believe it was the sending ip address that got them flagged or w that google was able to use to identify one other thing on warm-up that you that 
you brought up as a good point. I don't know if I want to just hit home on it is I would be super careful about separating the warm up from the sequencer. They kind of have to be in complete harmony together, right? And I've talked about this a lot. In fact, some of these warm up tools that kind of leave you with a false, like, like some of them I think are, first of all, they should be paying you in some ways, right? Like, you know, the way that they're doing it. And I, I'm like, why would anybody want to buy a warm up for their domain? I guess they don't understand on that is the warm up. It's this engagement model where you're kind of partnering with other cold email people or, or people sending emails. And that's why it's so critical that when that campaign ends, you have it turned back on. That's one of the functionality that you really need to have happen. And that really starts with the sequencer. I know Smartly does do this. And that's one of the things that is really important is that that warm up mode needs to be ready to go right at the end of that campaign. So you don't lose the quality of that inbox and let it go idle for a bunch of, you know, it's just then turning it back on is a problem. I completely agree. Just, just to add on to that piece as well. Um, and just look, I don't want to just keep pumping our product. There's, there's a bunch of them in the market. See whichever one works for you. Um, if you go with just a warm up tool, it's about intent of the warm up tool. So who goes to the warm up tool? People who don't have reputed mailboxes. So guess what? You're in the pool with everyone else who doesn't have reputed mailboxes, right? But if you go with a sequencer, like Jesse said, you know, for example, us, we've got lots of mailboxes that are aged, like super old. So you get that balance. And there's other tools as well, like I said, that also offer that. But if you go with something that's just the warm up alone by itself, then yeah, you know, you, you're, you're going to get exactly that is a bunch of people who are trying to do exactly what you're trying to do, which is guess what? Warm up a completely fresh mailbox. So yeah. I love it. I literally have to run out the door and go yeah, get so good. and take them to a place. Jesse, Bebop, thank you so much for joining. Um, if people are looking to get in touch, Jesse, what's the best way for them to reach out? By LinkedIn, just go on LinkedIn, Jesse will let, you can just find me in uh, lead, leadmagic.io, my company, uh, kind of helping people get uh, figure out who is on their website. Uh, and that would be that product. And, you know, let me know on LinkedIn if you need some help. Cool. And Bebop? Uh, uh, smartly.ai or um, my my name on LinkedIn is not many people with that. Uh, um, you'll be able to find me over there. Anything with you know emails and outbound sales, that's usually my goal. Perfect. Thank you so much, both of you. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you to the listeners. We'll see you all next week. Thank you.